year, uh, actually last year, is a hundred year anniversary of the birth of uh, the nuclear force. It was a hundred years ago, in 1911, that Ernest Rutherford discovered that atoms had a core, a center, called, which he called the nucleus. Before that, people were very confused as to what atoms were. They knew there were electrons, little points of electric charge inside atoms, but they didn't know what the structure was. Rutherford bombarded atoms with um, alpha rays, actually the nucleus of helium atoms, and measured the deflection off the uh, atoms of these heavy nuclei and realized that the only way he could explain those experiments was to assume that in the center of the atom there was a little place where all the mass, 99% of the mass of the atom and its positive charge was located, which he called the nucleus. And over the last hundred years, we have been probing and trying to understand what goes on inside the nucleus of atoms. And it, it was very difficult because one can't just look inside the atom. One has to follow Rutherford and hit the atom with all sorts of projectiles, other particles, and see what happens in the collision. That uh, journey has been a long journey, but we think we have arrived, in fact, over now over 30 years ago, at the answer. We now understand the forces that act within the nucleus. And the culmination of that 100-year uh, journey, maybe a 1,000-year journey, in fact, is to have a very detailed picture of all the forces of nature that act around us. They are, of course, the force of gravity, which we all feel, the force of electricity and magnetism that pulls electrical particles together and uh, governs uh, radio waves and light. And then there are these two mysterious forces a hundred years ago that act within the nucleus of atoms. And they're harder to understand because the distances involved are a million times smaller than the size of an atom. So it was not easy, and only after uh, the World War II did we start building these big particle accelerators to probe uh, the structure of the nucleus. What was discovered in the latter part of the 20th century was that it looked very much like nucleons, the things that make up the nuclei of atoms, protons and neutrons, were actually made out of particles uh, that were even smaller and more fundamental, called quarks, that were named quarks. But it was very strange because no one has ever seen a quark in the laboratory. And in fact, we now understand that you can never see a quark in the laboratory. But still, they believed that the proton and the nucleon, neutron were made out of quarks. The proton was actually three quarks somehow held together in a way that you could never pull them out. That was the situation when I entered physics as a student. People did not understand what was going on at all. There was no true understanding. The situation became even more confusing when people shot uh, electrons, which are, don't feel the strong force, but feel the, the electricity, at protons. And they could probe how these electrons interacted with whatever it is that makes up the proton and discovered, or their experiments could be interpreted as saying that the proton actually did consist of three quarks moving around as if there was no force between them. That seemed very strange in of itself, but also how could that be so if you couldn't pull the quarks out of the proton? See, if you hit an atom, an electron comes out and you can run it in wires and do all sorts of things with electricity. But you can't get the quark out of the atom, no matter how hard you hit it. People went to higher and higher energies, hit it harder and harder, no quarks. And yet in these experiments, it seemed that um, the quarks were moving around freely inside the proton. And that uh, confusion was um, explained finally, by uh, our discovery of what we call uh, called asymptotic freedom. Asymptotic freedom means that there are forces in nature. In fact, there's only one force in nature that does this, 
which is what we discovered, that has the very strange and unusual property that the force between two particles uh, becomes weaker and weaker the closer they are together. And the farther and farther they're apart, it becomes stronger and stronger. It's very counterintuitive. Usually, um, the force gets weaker when you pull things apart. They interact less strongly. But in this case, it was exactly the opposite, which was surprising, and led us to a very unique, specific theory of the nuclear force, which is called now quantum chromodynamics. It's not easy to explain how that works, but we understand in great detail how that comes about. It has to do with the properties of the quantum vacuum, which is fluctuating and boiling with virtual particles and quantum fluctuations. Uh, but we understand that now. And in this theory, we can uh, say an awful lot about what happens at these very short distances where the force becomes weak. We also can understand why the quarks can't get out, because when you try to pull them apart, the force, in effect, gets stronger and stronger, so strong that you can never pull the quarks out. This theory, uh, which has been developed for the last many decades, uh, has become extraordinarily powerful and useful in exploring physics and in uh, understanding what we're made out of. For example, you probably don't know what, what is the origin of your weight. When you step on the scale every morning and you say, oh my God, I've gained another kilogram, what makes up that mass? It's not the mass. It's the mass of all the protons and neutrons that the nuclei of carbon and all the atoms that exist in your body are made out of. But where does their mass come from? Those protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. So does it come from the mass of the quarks in your body? Quarks are almost massless. They don't have any mass. That's not what makes up your weight. What makes up your weight is energy. So you're pure energy. Energy, according to Einstein, is just the measure of mass. Or mass is the energy of a body at rest. So what makes up the mass of the proton is the energy of all the quarks inside the proton, which are zooming around very fast, almost the speed of light, inside a, a little region, a sphere. And that sphere is created by the fact that when the protons get too far apart, say the radius of the sphere, then the force between them gets very strong. So you are just confined kinetic energy of quarks and so-called gluons, the quanta of the force, inside this region of we call confinement, where the, those particles that are racing around are held together by this force that's getting stronger and stronger the farther apart they are. So it's a nice point of view. When you step on the scale in the morning, you see you've gained one kilogram. You've gained one kilogram of energy. So quantum chromodynamics is undoubtedly now, uh, we believe, the correct theory of the nuclear force. It's a rich theory, much richer than the theory of electricity and magnetism. The equations of QCD, of quantum chromodynamics, can be written down on a half of one t-shirt. But to solve them is not easy. There are many, many questions uh, about nuclear matter that are very interesting uh, that we are still working on and will be working on undoubtedly for hundreds of years. People still are working on the equations that govern the dynamics of fluids uh, for maybe 200 years, and there are many important unanswered questions. Turbulence. We can't still predict the weather with great accuracy. The same is true in quantum chromodynamics. The equations in, in the case of QCD are more beautiful and richer, but um, an enormous progress is being made on solving them. But this will take hundreds of years. And will go on, because in that realm of physics, we do, we believe, understand these basic laws basic equations. In some areas, in the area of what happens when you, when quarks interact at very high temperatures or very high energies, very high densities, the force gets weak. And when things are weak, it's easy to understand them. There, 
enormous progress has been made. It allows us, for example, it's one of the elements that allows us to, to understand the history of the universe back to the first microseconds, where the temperatures of the universe were so high and so dense that nuclear matter underwent a change of phase. We believe that what happened in the early universe is that there was a different phase of nuclear matter, much like ice. When you raise the temperature, it melts. If you raise the temperature in this room to 100 million degrees, the nucleons in your body would melt, and the quarks would come out, and you would have a kind of liquid of quarks and gluons. And we can observe that in experiments now by bombarding nuclei together at very high energies. We form a fireball, which is very hot, and for a very short time, quarks escape from the proton, and there is a quark-gluon liquid that, whose properties we are trying to understand in, in more detail. So there are many questions that are, will be continued to be explained, like in all fields of physics, for probably centuries. <laughs>